York, New York. It is arguably still the preeminent global financial center. As far as money and media go, it's the city that's the world headquarters for both. And so perhaps the title center of the world is fitting. But here's an unpleasant reality less talked about. While New York, both the city and the state were centers of the abolitionist struggle to finally end slavery, it was actually enslaved Africans that built the infrastructure of the colonial city. And it was that way from the 1600s to 1827, when slavery was legally abolished in New York City. We rarely think of New York as a slave-holding city, but it had more slaves than any other city except Charleston, South Carolina. It's inconvenient, uncomfortable, and for some, shameful. Perhaps that's why many shy away from talking about it. But not Alan Singer, who's lived in New York all his life. Dr. Singer is a professor of secondary education at Hofstra University and a former New York City High School social studies teacher. He's the author of New York and Slavery, Time to Teach the Truth. I met with Dr. Singer in Lower Manhattan. He agreed to take us to some of the most important sites related to slavery here. The African Burial Cemetery was used between the late 1600s and 1796 and originally contained between 10 and 20,000 burials. Despite the harsh treatment that these African people experienced in colonial America, the 427 bodies that eventually were recovered were actually buried with great care and love. They were wrapped in linen shrouds and placed in coffins that sometimes contained beads or other treasured objects. And what happens is the burial ground is listed on old New York City maps, but in the 1790s, as the city grew, the burial ground itself was just paved over. And then in the 1990s, the federal government decided to build this new office building here. And when they excavated this site for the foundation, they found hundreds and maybe thousands of uh, bodies that had been buried prior to 1790. All of a sudden, there was a tremendous investigation because it, what they discovered from the maps, this is the African burial ground. What happens is as New York City grew, people are familiar that Wall Street had a wall. But Wall Street wall was in 1664 when it was a Dutch city, New Amsterdam. When at the time of the American Revolution, it's a British city, and the wall is actually on Chamber Street, just on the other side of this building. Africans, even though they were Christian, were considered to be heathen, and they were not allowed to be buried on the church grounds within the city limits. So they are buried outside the wall in this area just outside New York City. Now, part of the reason that this area was used, it's also very swampy. Uh, just below, we'll see, is what, uh, an area they called the Collect, and behind that is an area called Five Points. It's very swampy areas. As a result, they were not prime for people to live. This was used as the African burial ground. The whole area was just paved over. It was lost to history. It was erased from the past and was only found when they started digging the foundation for this office building. The African-American community demanded answers after the cemetery was rediscovered in the 1900s. What eventually happens is uh, uh, forensic scientists and uh, anthropologists, archaeologists from Howard University investigate, they establish who these people were, they study the bones, they recognize the hardness of their life, and then the the people, about 500 people who are dug up, are then reinterred in a ceremony in these mounds. So these mounds contain about five, the remains of 500 people who originally were buried out through that whole area. Singer says that the time of the American Revolution around the 1780s, the population of New York was about 10,000. 15 percent of that population were enslaved Africans. In the United States, people usually think that slavery is an institution of the South. But slavery is actually a national institution. Now, in a place like New York, we're not looking at plantations. And we're not looking at primarily agricultural work. We're looking at people building the infrastructure of the city. We're looking at people clearing forests. We're looking at people building roads, building fortifications, dredging harbors. 
And the people who did this work were enslaved Africans. As we walked across the city to Foley Square, Alan tells me about how it was here that enslaved Africans, free blacks and white supporters accused of plotting the 1741 slave conspiracy were executed. White New Yorkers, afraid of a slave revolt, responded to rumors and unexplained fires with the arrest of 146 enslaved Africans, the execution of 35 blacks and four whites, and the transport to other colonies of 70 enslaved people. Historians continue to doubt whether a slave conspiracy ever existed. 1741, it's a bitter cold winter. It is so cold that the Hudson River freezes. What happens is, it, we're talking about a wood town. People are just burning whatever they can to keep warm, and there are fires that break out. In April, the white population of the city suspects that the black population, the enslaved population, is planning a rebellion. And then all of a sudden, 1741, over 150 enslaved Africans are arrested and accused of plotting this rebellion. What's interesting is the whites did not believe that the Africans could plan it, so they actually arrest a white tavern owner and accuse him of planning the uprising. So they're put on trial. And what happens at the trial is the Africans are basically given a deal. If you confess, we will send you to Barbados to live out the rest of your life on the sugar plantations. But if you don't confess, we're going to burn you alive at the stake. Some people confess. Uh, the four whites are hung. Uh, what happens is that the two of the Africans who accused of being the ringleaders, they refuse to confess. And they finally, they drag them here to, uh, to burn them alive. And they threaten to burn their families alive. And the two men ultimately, they say, OK, OK, we'll confess. And there's a mob of whites here, and they scream, and they want them executed. And these men are burned alive. Here? Right here at Foley Square. The thing is, with flesh burning on open flames, the stink would permeate the entire city of New York. Now, one of the things is there's actually a woodcut drawing of the scene. It shows families coming to watch the scene, very reminiscent of some of the scenes from the French Revolution of the guillotine. Uh, there's a commentator from New England who looks at the trial transcript and said, this is like the Salem witch trials. This is an hysterical population, fearful because of fire. All of a sudden attacks a helpless group of people, enslaved Africans, it executes 35 enslaved Africans, and the four whites they believe are the ringleaders happens right here in the city of New York. Navigating our way through the busy streets of downtown, we arrive at New York's famous City Hall. Although slavery ends in New York State legally, in 1827, city merchants and bankers continued to be tied to slave trade and slave-produced commodities. For example, William Havemeyer, mayor of New York City, launched his political career from the family's sugar refining business. The sugar was produced in the South and Cuba by enslaved African labor. Havemeyer owns a sugar company which offices are just across the East uh, River in Brooklyn. At, at the time, it's known as Havemeyer Sugar. Now it's known as Domino Sugar. Domino Sugar, owned by the mayor of the city of New York, is producing sugar in the Caribbean. And it's being processed in Brooklyn and distributed around the world. Another New York mayor, Fernando Wood, who later becomes a congressman, opposed and campaigned heavily against the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which abolished slavery. In uh, 1861, as the nation is moving to civil war, the South is starting to secede, the mayor of the city of New York actually gives a speech to the New York City Council, and he proposes that New York City secede along with the South. And he makes this proposal because he says they owe us so much money and we are so commercially tied together. If they leave and we stay, how will they ever pay us back? But it wasn't just the sugar trade, it was also cotton. Singer writes in his book, the founders of Brown Brothers Harriman built their bank by lending millions of dollars to southern planters and arranging for the shipment and sale of slave-grown cotton. 
When the bank took control of three Louisiana plantations at one point, it also got 346 enslaved Africans. John Jacob Astor, America's first multimillionaire, made his fortune in part through cotton transportation. He was also part of the slave trade. The Waldorf Astoria Hotel and neighborhoods in New York City are named after him. Lehman Brothers, a merchandising business that quickly evolved into a cotton brokerage firm, is another example. And finally, Charles L. Tiffany, who got the financing to open a fancy goods store from his father, who operated a cotton mill in Connecticut using cotton picked by southern slave labor. Tiffany & Co., the internationally renowned jeweler, was born. The list goes on. Today, the South Street Seaport is one of New York's many waterfront tourist attractions, with restaurants and gift shops. Singer explains that although in 1807 it was illegal to bring slave Africans into the United States, a restaurant named Sweets continued to be the meeting place of the global slave trade in secret, and just up the street was the bank that financed the slave trade, Citibank. Complex here dates from 1810. It's one of the oldest building complexes in the city of New York. Well, what happens, and then the waterfront is right here. What happens in the 1850s, there's a restaurant in this building right in front of us called Sweets. And Sweets is the meeting place of the global slave trade. Boats are outfitted in the harbor of New York, and what happens is it's illegal to bring enslaved Africans into the United States after 1807. In fact, the slave trade itself has been declared illegal by Great Britain and the United States. It's a capital offense after 1820 for an American to be involved in the slave trade. But we have documentation of what's happening because in 1854, one of the slave traders is arrested. He's turned in by his crew. He cheats them on pay. He's furious that he's being put on trial for slave trading. So he testifies, and his testimony is on the front page of the New York Times. And then later, he writes it up into a book. And he, what he says is that at Sweets, at South Street Seaport, at this restaurant, the slave traders meet to plan their voyages. And a couple blocks up this way, south of us on South Street, is the bank that finances the slave trade. And what they're doing is they call the Africans black ivory, and what they do is they outfit the boats here, they, they then sail to Africa. In Africa, they load enslaved Africans and they bring them back to Cuba. Amistad is not an isolated case, but Amistad is part of this transatlantic shipment of human beings. Dr. Singer was the director of the New York and Slavery Complicity and Resistance Curriculum. April Francis, Allen's former student at Hofstra University, joined us later on the tour along with her son Jalen, a senior in high school. April was a history major and is a graduate of the teacher certification program. She also holds a master's degree and certificate of advanced study. April helped edit and field test the New York and Slavery Complicity and Resistance curriculum. She teaches social studies at Lawrence Road Middle School in Uniondale, New York, where she is a cooperating teacher for students in the Hofstra Teacher Education Program. In 2005, the New York and Slavery Complicity and Resistance curriculum was awarded a National Council for the Social Studies Program of Excellence Award. Um, it was actually very shocking, you know, uh, teaching history Normally we talk about the North and South, and South being predominantly the area that slavery was um, the institution there. I knew New York once had slaves, but I didn't know New York was one of the last Northern states to end slavery. So when I found out all this history, not just about, you know, I'm thinking more rural area of New York, but right here in New York City, the amount of um, history and um, um, information that was sitting right here that no one really knew about. Uh, it was very interesting and I really wanted to um, participate in the project with him and help get that, that history out to our students and just to the general public. Alan, April and other team members have presented the New York and Slavery curriculum at local, state and national social studies conferences so teachers can have a blueprint on presenting their students with the opportunity to learn about slavery in New York and better understand race relations in general. 
Teachers can voluntarily choose to put the subject on their curriculum, but are not required. I ask April why she thinks that is. I think it's not that they want to hide, but it's a painful history. So how do you teach something without evoking emotion? And then when that emotion you know, um, comes out, how do you help students deal with it? So a lot of teachers are apprehensive because they don't know how to deal with the portion of the, the why question or how to deal with um, not feeling connected to that history. So, you know, uh, non-African American teachers sometimes don't feel comfortable speaking about it because of the, you know, the, 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 um, the pain behind it. So I, I wouldn't say that they're trying to hide it, it's just hard to discuss. But I think utilizing the curriculum, it, it allows people to take a step back and just use the material and say, this is the information, this is the primary source documents, and have that discussion and say, where are we at today and how can we move forward from this history? April says, as uncomfortable as it may be, it's important to know this part of New York's history. The topic of slavery is painful, but I believe that remembering, it's important to remember that history and not wipe it as a clean slate to act like it never existed. Because then you're saying all those people who sacrificed their lives um, and did the hard work of building up this area didn't exist. So it's important to say that, that we need to remember it, and it is painful to teach, but some of history isn't always that great, but it allows us to know where we don't want to be anymore. And for teachers that have a, um, you know, maybe a little bit apprehensive in teaching, and just let, letting them know that we have to give all sides of the story and allow the students to then determine or make their own judgments on that. So we as educators are there to give them the resources and allow them to help them to learn how to critically think then we have to give them that information. So all information is needed, no matter how painful we may feel it is in, in teaching it. America's uh, dark past, kind of, because you know every, well not every country, but just that was just our country's fault. You know the the racism and the slavery. It was just, but it, it was it was a time in the past, and it still carries on now. Like you see that with all the things happening now, and some people try to sweep it on the rug and don't teach it. Like I said in my school, but it's something that we should know, we should learn about. 1711, there's a brisk business in slaves, both in purchase and rental of slave labor. What happens is the boats come right up to the Wall Street grain market. In 1711, the town council, called the Common Council, decides that to coordinate the sale and rental of enslaved Africans, and really to make sure that they keep track and to prevent rebellion, all sale and rental of slave Africans will take place at the Wall Street slave market, right over here. And again, it was documented in the minutes of the town council. And in this curriculum that we developed, we include it. But there was never a marker here. Back in June, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio dedicated this plaque steps away from what was once the Wall Street slave market. The plaque honors those who passed through the slave market, located near Pearl and Water Streets. During a memorial, the mayor said it was true to three centuries ago, even though it was never acknowledged. It was true then, it is true today. It will be true tomorrow. Black Lives Matter.